Thank you very much, Minister, for coming into our studios at The Straits Times. Now, during the National Day rally, PM used very strong words like uh, get real and uh, be psychologically prepared for the possibility of conflict in the region. Do you think Singaporeans are indeed psychologically prepared for such a conflict, if well, it happens? Well, the first point I have to make is that the world has entered a very dangerous phase. And when I say dangerous, I mean it in multiple dimensions. First, war on a scale and at a level which has not happened for many decades. Small risk, but a real risk and a rising risk. Second, if you look at the global economy, we are entering a new phase of higher prolonged inflation and higher interest rates. We're entering a world where global supply chains that used to be based on efficiency are being disrupted. Third, we've just emerged from a global pandemic, COVID-19, but the probability of a next pandemic arising has risen and the possibility that the next pandemic will have higher mortality rate than COVID-19 is also a clear and present danger. Add to that the food security and I would say even water security. Uh, we are going to face in the near future a food and water and energy crisis. A further dimension, if you look at things domestically, is that societies everywhere are facing greater division, disruption, polarization, and inability to agree on a set of facts to agree on the right response and erosion of trust and cohesion within society. So if you add all these things up, war, inflation, famine, pandemic, and the loss of trust and cohesion within societies, all these factors lead us to a unfortunate new phase of geopolitics with profound implications for all of us. Now, your question is, do Singaporeans get it? I think Singaporeans do. Singaporeans are realist. We are in that sense, you know, uh, we know that we have to take the world as it is and not be wishful about what we hope the world would be. So my sense is, yes, Singaporeans do get it. We are real. But perhaps the extent to which this risk, this is something which we need to have hard conversations on uh, and tough discussions with each other. Picking up on that, how can we be better prepared? And, and how will the government step up efforts to have us ready for such a conflict in the event of... Well, if you use a medical analogy, we need to be immunised to be prepared for the challenges which this brave new world is throwing at us. I would say number one is to be better informed. Read the papers. I know it may not be fashionable now, but or at least watch the videos from SPH, CNA, Understand what is going on. Uh, understand the driving forces behind the individual episodes and incidents which are occurring in the world. And then second, after being well informed, as I said, have these heart-to-heart -heart open and tough discussions with one another. Seek out especially people who have different views in order to stretch our minds and expand our 
perspectives. Third point is after recognizing and seeking out people with diverse views, understand that because Singapore is small and fragile and facing an even greater level of challenge for the future, we need to stay united, we need to stay cohesive, we need to stay capable of making plans, more important, executing plans. And if you, based on what we just went through over the last two and a half years with COVID, one key competitive advantage we had was trust and cohesion. And the fact that we instinctively looked out for one another, even whilst recognizing that we are diverse. Okay, speaking about uh, seeking diverse views, reading the newspaper and watching you no know, news, um, all, all types of news, one specific challenge that PM raised was about social media and guarding against yes. hostile foreign influence, right? So we have so many things now on social media, WhatsApp, Weibo, WeChat, Facebook. How do we tell, you know, if you're seeking out diverse views, how do we tell whether a message is propaganda or, or really authentic, legitimate viewpoints? Well, I would put it to you this way. Look, we are all Singaporeans. We are blessed to be citizens of this sovereign, independent country called Singapore. So our first and paramount objective is to jealously safeguard our sovereignty and independence. Second principle is to understand what are Singapore's and Singaporeans' long-term national interests. So when I say national interests, understand that we are a unique and fragile country that's only 57 years old. And everything that we measure and assess must be looked at in terms of what is in Singapore's interest. The third point then is to understand that we don't take sides, but we will be prepared to stand up and to defend existential principles. And that's another point that PM emphasized. You can't just take cover, keep quiet, hope nobody notices and somehow get away with it. From time to time, we have to be prepared to stand up say what we feel is critical for the survival and the prosperity of a tiny city-state like us. But we don't take sides. We are not pro-anyone or anti-anyone. We are only pro-Singaporeans. Now, if you, once you understand these three principles, right? Independence, sovereignty, Singapore's long-term interests, and that we don't take sides, then your question becomes, well, are people trying to influence us? Are messages coming to us with ulterior motives? And the answer to it very clearly is yes. Precisely because we are small, but credible and relevant and independent. What Singaporeans think and say and what the government expresses on behalf of Singaporeans does matter. So you're right on that whole tsunami of social media, private messaging platforms. We are all exposed to a very wide variety of messages, a significant number of which in fact originate outside Singapore, whose objective is not necessarily the long-term interests of Singapore, but to further their objectives. So it requires certain skepticism, mm. Mm. a certain openness to facts but not being gullible. And as I said, I want, again want to emphasize the need to check with credible sources of information. And here, you know, I would say our mainstream media remains a credible source of information. And we, it is important that we keep that reputation. 
then we have a population that is well informed, that is able to exercise judgment and still able to make assessments and plans and to execute those plans. How big a threat do you see such influences? It's a big threat. It's a clear and current danger. Let, let's unpack social media at two levels. One is that the social media companies are optimized for revenue maximization. They're not necessarily optimized for the propagation of facts or even necessarily reasonable, rational discourse. What has wings on social media? And if you just go by the algorithms, anything that incites, anything that makes people angry, anything that is scandalous or you know, raises emotional temperature, those are the messages that fly. Now, secondly, it is also very clear in the last few years that state and non-state actors have also latched on to these very powerful tools mm -hmm. to push a view, to manipulate opinions, to divide and to erode trust and cohesion within the target societies. And in Singapore, we must be painfully aware that this is what we are exposed to. So what PM is, is telling and reminding all of us is please be aware, these things are going on, we are receiving it, and precisely because we are a multilingual, multiracial, open society, we are more vulnerable in that sense. But I still believe that Singaporeans are also sensible, pragmatic people. Uh, we're not just going to swallow everything hook, line and sinker. Okay, you touched a little bit on sovereignty earlier. Well, Singapore is the only Southeast Asian nation to impose sanctions on Moscow uh, for their invasion of Ukraine, right? Over the last five, six months, yourself and PM have explained why it was important for Singapore to take such a strong stance. Yet, there are still some Singaporeans who are not convinced. Okay, So how big do you think this group is? And do you worry about downstream effects? Perhaps, like you said, eroding trust or even threatening to weaken um, Singapore's unity? Well, the first thing I would say is that certainly if you look at the United Nations, 141 countries voted to condemn this invasion of a sovereign, independent country. An act of aggression which clearly flouted core principles of the UN Charter. Respect for independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity. You are right, precisely because we are small and only 57 years old, when a big power threatens to or actually tries to redraw boundaries on the basis of historical errors and crazy decisions. All alarm bells go off, and especially in Singapore. So there was no question that we had to take a stand. I think you can argue about the tone and how tall you stand when you take a stand. But I am convinced the majority, the vast majority of Singaporeans, and indeed people all over the world, are not comfortable with a world in which might is right, in which a big neighbour gets to redraw boundaries, or to use force or to threaten the use of force in order to bend and subvert the will and the cohesion of a neighbour. Now, the second order issue then, I mean, you mentioned sanctions, and actually we have been very, very careful. We have been very careful. In normal times, we only comply with United Nations Security Council resolutions. But this was not a normal time. This was an invasion launched by a permanent member of the Security Council with veto rights. 
prepared to exercise a cynical vote to veto a Security Council resolution. Because of that, we felt, we decided that targeted sanctions, especially on arms and dual use equipment, which could be used to inflict harm or death on Ukrainians, was necessary. So that again, in our own way, was a principled response to what we felt was an existential threat to international law, to the UN Charter, and ultimately a grave danger to Singapore now and in the future. So we took a stand. Okay, talking about danger, I know this is um, not part of the NDR, but it is a timely one, a uh, timely question in view of your speech at the uh, recent ASEAN foreign ministers meeting in Cambodia. You said then that it was a dangerous moment, profoundly dangerous yes, moment. Okay, so, but at the same time, you expressed hope that US and China will work out an arrangement that allows for a, a peaceful coexistence, right? So what kind of indicators will you be looking for in the coming months? Well, I stand by my assessment that this is still a moment of profound danger. As far as the US and China is concerned, unfortunately, things are not moving in the right direction. And the risk of a mishap or miscalculation is real and in fact rising. Is that your there current is, reading of the situation? That's my current assessment of the situation. So profound danger and risks are rising. There is another dimension to it, which is, you know, you. I can also speak with personal, based on personal observations and interactions with the leaders of America, China, EU, and many other parts of the world. I do not believe any one of them are actually setting out to wage war on each other. But I do worry that there is a very real risk each party unilaterally deciding what its national interests are and what its response or counter response to the other party will be may inadvertently set itself up for an escalatory spiral. You get what I mean? So it's not that they are out for war, but they may be locked into a spiral of measure, countermeasure, response, counter-response, which may escalate up a spiral. My deep anxiety is that it reminds me of the situation before the First World War. The major powers before the First World War did not set out for war. In fact, it was a period of great interdependence and even global trade at the turn of the last century. Nobody felt that war made sense. Nevertheless, a series of steps, incidents, mishaps, and this locked-in spiral led to a very terrible situation. So that's why I remain so concerned about the prospects of global peace. Now, having said that, you know, the to be a diplomat, you must have some hope, some optimism. And the world is not short of global challenges. And the examples are the pandemic, climate change, food and water security. And if we could only elevate our gaze to these global challenges and to and immediately realize that this can only be solved if America and China and Europe and Asia 
and all the rest of us come up with a, for, a multilateral rules-based constructive response to protect the global commons. Now, if you can just imagine or hope that we don't end up in a world war, and that in fact all the major players understand that it is in the world's interest and in their own long-term interest to set aside the differences, negotiate where they can negotiate, hold certain issues in abeyance if need be, be patient, strategic patience, focus on the immediate challenges of the global commons, harvest the new tools that technology is providing with us. We can have another glo you know, golden age, but hopefully without having to go through a war first. Again, to make an allusion to history, if you think about the end of the Second World War, it was remarkable because the vanquished losers were given opportunities to rebuild. Countries which were formerly colonized were given independence. And that includes most of the developing world, including Singapore. Countries which were prepared to modernize and industrialize early took off in that post-World War II scenario. And that includes Singapore. The United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, created a set of multilateral global rules, which generally, generally ensured peace and facilitated development. We had the WTO, which facilitated global trade. That's why, especially in the last 40 years, the world enjoyed an unprecedented period of peace, low inflation, low interest rates, great development, a catch-up, a reduction in the gap between the developing world and the advanced worlds. But it also became a hyper-competitive world. And the fact of the matter is, what that also led to was an erosion of cohesion within some of the more advanced countries because clearly when you have a step change in technology and in the means of production, you get winners and losers. And if your social safety nets, if your education and your reskilling, retooling uh, system does not give hope to all segments of society, you see the division and polarization and division which we currently witness in many advanced countries. So I'm, I'm spelling this out so that the Singaporeans understand what an unusual period of growth and opportunity Singapore enjoyed over the last six decades. But I'm also raising a amber light to see that period has come to an end. And that's what PM means by get real. We better have our antenna out, understand what is happening globally, understand what this means for Singapore, and better get ready. Uh, SM Taman has called this a perfect long storm. And if there is going to be a, if there, and I believe there is a perfect long storm, we better have our umbrellas and our raincoats and our contingency plans in place. But I still believe the most important ingredient, the most important competitive advantage that Singapore has, has been our ability to trust one another, to make rational decisions and to execute it. So on that, that, that note actually gives me confidence and gives me hope that Singaporeans have it. We have the wherewithal to do what needs to be done to cope with this you know, perfect long storm 
this new, profoundly more dangerous world. I really like your optimism, Minister. And it's obviously very, very important to be optimistic. But supposing there is no peaceful co coexistence, yes. what will be your outlook for Singapore? It means the earlier decades of heady, steady growth with low inflation are over. It means we will have to, in fact, double down on the restructuring of the economy. We can't defend jobs or technologies which are becoming obsolete. Equally important is what uh, DPM Lawrence Wong has emphasized, the need for us to review the social compact. Because maintaining that sense of unity and that we're all in this boat together, and we do need to look out for each other. And yet we need to do so whilst keeping our eyes on the horizon and externally and trying to find the new sources of where's the new, where's the wind coming from? Where the new, how do we set our sails accordingly? There's one area which is going to be very difficult for us, which we will obviously try our best to avoid and is that we will resolutely refuse to choose sides. And I would say, so far, so good. Uh, all the major powers have told us, we don't expect you to choose sides. Now, whether that will, how long they will maintain that position, I don't know. So I will expect the current and the future government of Singapore to face even more geopolitical pressure in the future. And one key point which I would make from, you know, after my years in MFA, is that actually foreign policy begins at home. Without a united population, without a population immunized against foreign interference or influence, you will find that the future governments of Singapore will be constrained in our pursuit of and our protection of our long-term national interests. So I believe and I accept the challenge that we do need to educate. We do need to have far more discussions domestically with our own people about how the world has changed and why we take the stands we take and why we must not take sides and we must not be gullible. And paradoxically, I found, at least with the current leaders in the world, that because they know Singapore is small and rational and is not anyone's vassal state and does not wish harm on any other state. Uh, when we do need to take a stand and when we do need to have a difference, they respect it. That I have found to be of, you know, a unique value. Uh, and it's actually made my job as foreign minister so much easier. Because, you know, you say I'm from Singapore, there is already a preformed set of expectations. And doors are open, and we're able to have constructive, respectful, and candid discussions. So I, I, I'm just signaling that there's going to be more pressure, more push and shove in the future, but the answers are still the same, right? Understand we defend our sovereignty, our independence, understand our unique circumstances and therefore what our interests are. Don't take sides, take stands, but remain united, remain resolute. And if we do that, in fact, the emerging opportunities of this revolution 
uh, will put Singapore in a very good position. So that's my hope. Thank you very much, Minister, for speaking with me today. You're most welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank and you. thank you for, you know, in a sense, launching these robust and open discussions, which are so essential, not just here, not just publicly, but privately as well. Thank you. Thanks.